I'm very happy to see familiar faces as well as new faces. Uh, tonight's event promises to be very interesting. Uh, two presentations, one by Michalis Papapetru and another man, one by Simeon Matsi, on the political and the economic repercussions on the Cyprus uh, problem if, if there is no solution. So, the way we are going, I think we won't have a solution. So it's good to know what we are, what, what, what's in for us. We're going to start with Michalis Papapetru, who will uh, do the political aspect of the matter. He was born in Nicosia, he studied law in Athens and London, and after his studies, he returned to Cyprus and worked as a lawyer. In 1975, he was elected president of Edon till 1987, while in uh, 1985, he was elected member of parliament of the Agel party. In 1990, he resigned from Agel and initiated the Aristov party, of which he was an MP, vice president, and president from 1992 onwards. In 1996, Adisok joined forces with Mr. Vasilius Pazdiket and formed the United Democrats, where he served as vice president and president since 2005. Following the decision of the United Democrats to support Mr. Kiridis for the presidency in 1998, Baba Petru was appointed government spokesman until 2003, and he was part of the negotiation team during the Kiridis Dektash talks. Michalis Papabetru pulled out of political life in 2007, but remained, remained still an active political citizen, caring always for his country. He is presently practicing law and a member of many bicommunal committees working for its reconciliation and peaceful coexistence. Mihani, you do have the honor. <coughs> Good. Rita reminded me of some nightmares of the past. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to share with you some of the ideas concerning the solution of the Cyprus problem. I should be very happy should I be able to be a bit more optimistic that I will appear. But nevertheless, I'll try to share with you with sincerity what I evaluate and what I think is happening in our country nowadays. Politics is the art of the feasible which arises as a result of evaluating the real situation as well as the possibilities of each side, limiting sentiment as much as possible. In this respect, I suggest that during the history of the Cyprus problem, the Greek Cypriot side, with few exceptions, acted mainly with emotion and sentiment rather than logic. As a result, impossible or not achievable targets were set, which eventually complicated further the situation and push, pushed an acceptable compromise solution even further away. In a problem that lasts from the 1940s, to say the least, and the two communities being in clash since 1963, there can be no easy nor ideal solution. The solution must constitute a compromise. Otherwise, there can be no solution. After so many decades of unsuccessful efforts, it's obvious that in Cyprus, we shall either achieve in our last effort reunification within the frame of a bizonal bicommunal federation or we shall have partition of the island with Turkey in reality having a hard border of 180 kilometers within Cyprus. 
All other theories are senseless and in reality aim to preserve the today's status quo, i.e. the so-called second best solution that prefers instead of a reunited country, half of it to be Greek and half of it to be Turkish. The UNFISHIP is present in Cyprus for 56 years. Numerous secretary generals, the Security Council envoys and special representatives spent thousands of hours trying to reach a compromise solution. Maybe there is no other international problem on which the UN and other international players spend so much effort and energy. After all these repeated failures to solve the Cyprus problem, the question that arises is whether such a solution is really possible. There is no doubt that the possibilities are much less now than before. And they continue to lessen in a problem where the fair complete on the island create new interests on the personal or group level, as well as complications, the Greek Cypriot side myopically adopted the tactics of a long-term struggle. The Greek Cypriots failed to understand that it is not the same to search for solution with 10,000 settlers than with 200,000 settlers. To have the Turkey Cypriot community organized in a state, so-called state, even recognized only by Turkey, the occupation force, than to deal with a community. With people born and living in Cyprus for 30 or 40 years, and to describe them as settlers that have to leave Cyprus. Many faulted interest gain space and those ready and willing, willing to drop them are fewer as the time lapses. The prolongation of the Cyprus problem creates dangers for further complications. It creates new fair complete. The culture of separation is strengthened and frustration as to the possibility of reunification is spreading among citizens in both sides. The population is alienated and the coming together is becoming more difficult. It is more than evident that the only practical way to reunify Cyprus is within the frame of a bizonal bicommunal federation, taking into account all the acquis the aki gained from the previous rounds of negotiations and the food for thought submitted by the United Nations all these years. If a political problem is not solved within a reasonable period of time, and the Cyprus problem is very, but very delayed, then deviations to less just or acceptable arrangements is becoming more realistic. If somebody wishes to be in co contact with reality, he should but admit that the effort for a unification solution in the frame of a federation is given its final chance. If for any reason no federal solution is reached within the present and next year, then obviously other partition solutions shall prevail with the enormous danger such development not only to fail to solve the problem, but instead to plant the seeds of new, enormous and dangerous frictions in Cyprus. A solution which practically means a hard border with Turkey within Cyprus shall be a nest for clashes and tension with catastrophic results. In the summer 2017, the two sides met in Grands Montana and they came very close to a positive final outcome. The Secretary General called upon both sides 
to walk the final mile and urge them to transform the narrowing of the differences achieved into a final solution. It was obvious that both sides, but mainly the Greek Cypriot side, failed to evaluate correctly the historic character of that meeting. The unique opportunity was not taken at advantage of, and the Secretary General did not hesitate to name those he considered responsible. He attributed the responsibility for the failure to the two Cypriot leaders. At the same time, he praised all guarantor countries, Turkey included, for their efforts and contribution towards a solution believe it or not. This contradicts the official Greek Cypriot story of events, putting all the blame on Turkey. Circles of the United Nations, the European Union and other diplomatic missions support the Secretary General's attitude and allege that Turkey gave clear signals of readiness to withdraw its army, with the exception of the two regiments agreed upon in 1960, whose withdrawal should be decided by prime the prime ministers of the guarantors at a later stage, as well as its readiness to renegotiate a new system of international guarantees surrendering at the same time its unilateral right for intervention in Cyprus. These Turkish positions were described as conditional with an overall agreement. It was for this reason that the Secretary General submitted a six points frame where all the above plus the return of Morfu were included in a very clear-cut manner, trying to bridge the remaining differences. Unfortunately, the Greek Cypriot side, instead of investing on this important document, proposition by the Secretary General, let the time pass, as usual, every time we have presidential elections, and flirting with extremist policies of Digo commence by challenging the proposal of Kuderes, alleging possession of minutes that in reality never existed, playing with words, thus losing valuable, valuable time and credibility, and giving the impression to the whole world that it was searching for excuses to avoid the approach to the Secretary General's frame. Even the proposal by Mr. Akinji for the parties to countersign the, the frame as strategic agreement for the solution and immediate commencement of talks in order to conclude the final agreement remained unanswered by Mr. Anastasiadis. This strange situation should be considered, having also in mind the initiative of Mr. Anastasiadis or the alleged initiative of Mr. Anastasiadis, to abandon the federal solution to a solution partition in Cyprus he allegedly proposed to Mr. Chavusoglu in Gras Montana, and which he also discussed with tens of Greek Cypriots internally, some of whom are present tonight with us. The strengthening, further, he proceeded to abandon key chapters already agreed upon in the negotiations, undermining the momentum and opening the road to new demands by the Turkish side. The strengthening of the powers of the Federated States or the substitution of the presidential to a parliamentary system as proposed by Mr. Anastasiadis is characteristic. The Greek Cypriot leaders, including Mr. Anastasiadis, for many years struggled 
to enlarge the powers of the central government. And when this was achieved, the position that additional powers should be given to the federated states was submitted. At the same time, these new theories, practically annulling political equality as described in the UN resolutions and agreed upon in the talks, created a turmoil of distrust among the two communities. In a recent in interview, Mr. Anastasiadis asked Erdogan whether the, he accepts the Kurds to have the right to block decisions of the Turkish government. Obviously, he did not realize that what Erdogan agreed was a federal solution in Cyprus and not in Turkey. After Grand Montana, it seems that Ankara is trying to implement its threat that if no solution was to be found until then, then new approaches should be adopted. In this respect, Ankara, Tatar, and Ozasai campaign for a solution of two states, and so far it is the heroic stance of Mustafa Akinji that led in, the, in Berlin uh, the reconfirmation of bizonal federation as the desired solution. The question is, until when Akinji's resistance could be effective? An operation to politically extinguish Akinji so that he fails to be reelected is underway both in Ankara and the occupied part of Cyprus. All these years, the Turkish leader proved to be steady, serious, moderate, and sensible. Even from the first hours of his re-election in 2015, when he set the record rights in line with the targets of the United Nations, Erdogan attacked him by wondering whether Akinji's ears listen what his mouth says. It is true that Akinji always had a positive stance. I do not allege that he always agreed with the Greek Cypriots, something that only naive should expect. But he was behaving like a Turkish Cypriot and not like a Turk nationalist. Recently, he adopted an, he adopted an even more bold stance for the first time, so openly, questioned the targets and the directions of Ankara with the result that both Turkish officials and as well as Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots, sorry, uh, right-wing establishment to characterize him as traitor and unsuitable to be the leader of the Turkish side. The Greek Cypriot official response should be noticed with interest. In reality, the government and the majority of the political parties indirectly or directly challenging the Solution Federation strengthened the argumentation of Tatar and Angera. Instead of sending positive messages to the Turkish Cypriot community they react in the logic, you take measure, we take countermeasures. Turkey is organizing a new supplementary invasion in the first area of Famagusta. And Greek Cypriots, instead of associating with the Turkish Cypriots that demonstrate against this move, they proceed to block European aid for harmonization of the Turkish community to the Aki and which is designated to address the interests of simple Turkish Cypriot citizens. At the same time, they continue to question Akinji's sincerity by saying that he pretends to disagree with Ankara for tactical reasons in order to win the elections. And they describe him as a puppet of Ankara and as an occupation leader. The question is, 
Whom do they support and strengthen with such an approach? I have not the slightest doubt that tension, nationalistic confrontation and cultivation of hostility and fear among the two communities serve the extremists as well as the partition of the island. The deadlock in Cyprus strengthens the fait accompli and makes reunification more and more difficult. The messages of the Greek Cypriots not only fail to open the road to compromise and solution, but to the contrary, they kill hope. For decades, Famagusta was a city under attack. The non-solution led to a, just a step before its colonization. One cannot forget that in the past, where confidence-building measures were proposed, when there were prospects to proceed with the return of Famagusta, we heard from official Greek Cypriot lips that we are not going to surrender and sell out Cyprus in exchange of five neighborhoods of Famagusta. The tragic is that as things proceed, together with the five neighborhoods of Famagusta, half of Cyprus shall be finally lost to Turkey, whilst the other half shall be burdened and endangered by obvious future adventures. In the last years, a new factor entered the equation of the Cyprus problem. The issue of hydrocarbons, it was said from the very beginning that could either become a bridge for peace, cooperation and prosperity, or a curse. This issue offered possibilities to create a win-win situation, not only for Cypriots, but also for Turkey and other neighboring countries. It has been encouraging that during the talks, the two Cypriot sides agreed on the handling and distribution of income. The problem that arises is what the situation might be until we reach a solution. The Turkish side demanded co-administration, something the Greek side rejects as contrary to the recognition of only one state in Cyprus, the Republic of Cyprus. Throughout various incidents, creating tension within the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, caused by the Turkish violation of international law, and the Greek underestimation of real dangers to lead things to a military clash between Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus, the need to have a breakthrough on the issue is more necessary than ever before. Instead of using hydrocarbons as a weapon, we should rather opt to treat it as an opportunity for cooperation. I'm afraid that the lack of flexibility and the hardening of the Greek Cypriot position in the talks facilitated Turkey to promote an imperialist policy on the matter, which obviously violates international law. Nevertheless, despite the governmental efforts to create illusions, the Greek Cypriots realized that the solidarity and support from European Union and the international community, it is very difficult to go further, further than verbal support. It is my understanding that the Turkish army, which practically invaded almost all countries of the region, is treated by the international community as a power factor instead of being considered as one of, main, of the main causes of tensions and illegality. The Turkish threat to flood Europe with millions of Syrian refugees and African and Asian immigrants proves to be the main concern instead of implementation of international law. Preservation of tension in Eastern Mediterranean and the explosive situation in Greek-Turkish relations can lead to no positive results. The efforts for reunification of Cyprus 
within the frame set up by the international community shall be dead. It is for this reason that a wise and flexible leadership should not rush to refuse the proposal of suspension of drillings by all sides, something that de facto is taking place due to COVID-19, whilst the efforts to resume talks and solve the problem are still alive. Flexibility is strength if this serves the interest of your people. To the contrary, a dogmatic attitude which says dignity in inverted commas but leads to catastrophe and defeat should not be an option. The tension between Greece and Turkey is explosive. There is only one way out, international law. Recourse to the court in The Hague seems to be one way. I strongly believe that the recent agreement between Italy and Greece vis-a-vis -vis their seasons offers the basis for an agreement between Turkey and Greece. Chavusoglu accepted the spirit of this agreement which is recognizing the rights of big islands like Corfu, Kefalonia and Zagintos to continental shelf and exclusive economic zone. Same way, Crete, Rhodes, Samos, etc. should have similar rights, something that Turkey today refuses. Similarly, Small islands in the Ionian, i.e. Othoni, were recognized with 30% limited rights. Likewise, the same should apply with Castel Orizo, which is smaller than Othoni. There is also another issue. Greece rightly treats the Lausanne Treaty of 1923 as the Holy Bible concerning the borders between Greece and Turkey. At the same time, I don't consider it reasonable to deny other provisions of the same treaty, i.e. the obligation of Greece not to fortify or arm some of these islands. And another similar issues, issue <coughs> <coughs> we face every day. Greece extended long ago its airspace to 10 miles, while the territorial waters extend to 6 miles. This disappropriation is not recognized by international or by organizations worldwide. Therefore, flights of Turkish planes between the 6 and the 10 miles of airspace are not considered by them as violation of the Greek airspace. And uh, the majority of third countries adopt the same position contrary to the Greek allegations. As the time lapses, perils are increased. The United Nations started raising concerns about the renewal of the presence of UNFISIP, especially when the necessary stance towards compromise by the parties is not demonstrated. The renewal of UNFISIP ceased for some time now to be a typical easy and automatic process. Every time new concerns are raised by the international community. The most recent UNFISIP renewal resolutions included onerous provisions which normally should ring a bell to the Greek Cypriots. I have the feeling that Greek Cypriots failed to understand in depth what might take place in Cyprus if and when UNFISIP withdraws. The no man's land consisting 3% of the Republic of Cyprus territory shall be immediately endangered. The incidents in the area of Denia, 
and elsewhere during the last year are indicatory of the huge possibility for this area to be taken over by the Turkish Occupation Army. Furthermore, National Guard and the Turkish Army will come face to face with no third neutral, neutral peace force being present to set the facts right and prevent violations and provocations, or even impartially report about them. As a, sacred, as a Greek Cypriot, I strongly believe that the continuation of the status quo will make the solution more onerous and more problematic. In order to achieve all this, I mean a solution, peace and cooperation, we are in urgent need for a compromise solution. The Secretary General set the frame towards his goal. He asked both sides to prepare for a final round of talks immediately after the Turkish Cypriot elections next October. This effort shall be a vit of vital importance. We cannot fail. It is for this reason that the United Nations asked both sides not only to prepare for these talks, tailoring their positions within the Guderes frame and Berlin communique, but at the same time, until then, to undertake initiatives that will create a favorable political atmosphere to facilitate the solution. What we witnessed so far is not in line with the request of the Secretary General. In the Turkish side, the parties that form the coalition of the so-called government directly campaign against federation, and they are openly supported by the Turkish government. At the same time, the Greek Cypriot leadership tried to be typically in line, but in substance they failed to embrace the message and the spirit of the Secretary General's framework. I don't want to limit myself to generalities. I shall be concrete on what I should anticipate from the two leaders. I should expect them to meet every second week until talk starts, to tackle issues that they shall turn the general atmosphere more positive and constructive, to exchange visits in the respective areas, to address respective audiences in both sides, to change the language of confrontation used on a daily basis. to send concrete and constructive messages for peace and cooperation. This is the way how to respond to the request of Guderes, and at the same time to refrain from provocations either in the no man's land or Varosha that directly violate the UN resolutions. Instead of that, we witness Mr. Anastasiadis to adopt measures which, to say the least, are provocative and cultivate confrontation and tension. I'll refer to the closing of the four passages in Cyprus. I don't underestimate the danger of COVID-19, but I want to, refer, to, to remind you that at the time, at the, at the time he decided to close down the four passages, there was not a single uh, incident of COVID-19 in Cyprus. Uh, and uh, the excuse was ridiculous. We had not enough nurses, no policemen to man the checkpoints. At the same time, we could preserve relations and exchanges with Italy, the UK and other countries, despite numerous cases of infection. In this respect, the confrontation with, you, the, with UNFICIP, with the allegation that they should not have a say concerning the communication of the two communities through the checkpoints, 
is unthinkable. And the turning of the crisis in Turkey's Greek borders to a Turkey-Cyprus confrontation is a dangerous and unnecessary move. The attack by Mr. Anastasiadis against Mrs. Peha and the UN in general is not something new. Mrs. Speher's name was just added to a long catalog, including practically almost all special representatives of the Secretary General. These unfounded accusations reflect, reflect the disagreement of the Greek sides to the sort of solution the UN is working for the last decades. I enter the final page. This was evidence in Kranz Montana with Anastasiadis in 2017. Before, Christophias in 2010, when he turned, when he turned down the request of Ban Ki-moon to endorse the basic convergences in the talks, and thus opened the road to the defeat of Talat and the election of Eroglu in the elections of the Turkish Cypriots. And of course, in 2004, with the negative vote of the Greek Cypriots in the referendum of the UN Plan for Solution. The question is, if we don't like the frame of the UN, then why we continue to consider the UN as the only international organization which can bring about a solution? unless we are playing for time, expecting some miracle which will turn things to our favor. But miracles do not take place in the 21st century. It should be understood that we live, maybe, in the most dangerous part of the world. A mistake is more than enough for an explosion. And it should be understood that if such an event, in such an event, no side shall be in a position to claim victory. The defeated shall be the peoples, shall be peace, shall be the prospect for peace, peaceful and prosperous lives for our children. Thank you very much. Simeon, please. Uh, 
Unfortunately, there are no colors, and therefore <laughs> my reference to colors to, on, on the diagrams will not be clear, but I will try. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Thank Rida for organizing this uh, event. Um, what I am going to talk about <coughs> is, uh, okay, it's a colder subject than what uh, Michalis has been talking. I am going to talk about the economy. But I'm only going to talk about the economy of the Turkish Cypriots. I'm not going to talk about the Greek Cypriot uh, situation. It's not necessary. We know it. Most of you know it. We know what's been happening. So what I'm going to try and do, I will try to describe the major economic changes that took place within the Turkish Cypriot uh, community. And I'm going to talk only about what happened after 2004, after the rejection of the Annan plan and uh, the entry of Cyprus into the European uh, Union. Then I will try and give you my personal interpretation of uh, what uh, I think the impact of the changes, of these changes in the Turkish Cypriot community mean uh, about the possible solution of the Cyprus uh, problem. <coughs> I will start with a word, of, a word of caution. My analysis depends on the published data by the Turkish Cypriots. Uh, as they are published, and unfortunately, they are published about two to three years later. And therefore, I will be talking about the economic situation of the Turkish Cypriot community, not today, but as it was in 2017, or as it developed between 2003 and 2017. In addition, I would also like to say that what has happened since with the, sick, uh, with the spreading of the coronavirus means that the situation is now changing dramatically and it is extremely difficult to interpret these in, uh, this <coughs> latest developments and how they will impact on the economic situation in each community and hence in their political ramifications. So, let me start. I will start to describe the major changes as I see them about the, uh, for the Turkish Cypriot uh, economy. The first important differentiation that has been the economic development of the North and the rise in the standard of living of the Turkish Cypriot. So we have to understand that the Turkish Cypriots are not our poor brethren, uh, brothers as we used to think of them. They are much more affluent uh, today than they were uh, in uh, the, uh, it, what, what shall I say, which period, uh, uh, right after uh, they created their own uh, uh, pseudo-state. Mm -hmm. Turkish Cypriot real gross national income is now three times higher than it was in 2003. Okay, three times higher. Their, Turkish, their, their gross national uh, income. During this period, of course, we know, which means 2003-2017, what happened in the Turkish Cypriot economy is that we stagnated. So what we see is the rise of the Turkish Cypriot standard of living as it is shown by the high uh, line and the stagnation of the, Turkish, of the, Cypri of the Greek Cypriot uh, economy. <coughs> so this is one of the main changes. What, so what does it mean? The main outcome of these developments has been a substantial reduction in the difference between the respective per capita national income. Uh, in 2003, the per capita in uh, national income of the Turkish Cypriots was about 30% of that of the Greek Cypriots. In the years since then, uh, and in the years 2014-2017, uh, 
uh, there was a substantial narrowing of this uh, gap. It means that the big superiority of the Greek Cypriot the, uh, gross national income per capita is no, does no longer hold and does not represent the advantage through which the Greek Cypriots hope to entice the Turkish Cypriots to a solution. <coughs> and this is the situation. Uh, this is the per capita uh, diagram two on the left shows the per capita uh, uh, development of the uh, national income of both the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. The Greek Cypriot is the high line, the Turkish Cypriot is the below line. But diag diagram three uh, shows the real uh, gross national income of the Turkish Cypriot as a percentage of the Greek Cypriot. And what it shows is from 30% that was in 2003, it is now about 60% of, uh, of the equivalent uh, uh, per capita gross national income. <coughs> The second big change is that the economic growth in the north was ac uh, accompanied by the creation of a large number of employment opportunities. The Turkish Cypriot economy uh, created many employment opportunities between 2004 and 2017, allowing gainful, uh, uh, allowing gainful employment to rise from 87,000 in 2004 to 121,000 and this, this is uh, the situation that happened with gainful employment in the Turkish Cypriot uh, economy. So we can see that there was a big rise. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, uh, we have now full employment, or at least in 2017, because it's not now, uh, full employment conditions in, in, in the Turkish Cypriot uh, economy. Uh, when uh, there was unemployment in the Greek Cypriot one. Uh, so there was a fall in the unemployment from 2000, 2009 uh, to 7.5,000. So what does that mean is that now the unemployment level of the Turkish Cypriot is only 5.8%, uh, and it's much lower than the equivalent uh, on the Greek Cypriot side, which was 11.1 percent. This, uh, I will show you. This are the two, the uh, evolution of the unemployment level in the two communities. Uh, the okay, there is no color, as I said, so I cannot. <laughs> but think of it: the one that is high is the Greek Cypriot uh, situation, as far as unemployment is concerned. Now, I would like to turn to what has happened in terms of um, uh, sectoral developments in the, in the Turkish Cypriot economy and to identify the sectors which have helped the Turkish Cypriot economy grow. And the reason why I want to identify these uh, sectors is because they are the foreign exchange er earners for the uh, Turkish Cypriot. The first, of course, is tourism. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, it has become the most important uh, production sector of the Turkish Cypriot economy in terms of foreign exchange earnings. Uh, uh, look at the numbers in order to understand. In 2003, there were only, only 470,000 visiting the Turkish Cypriots. 2017, the number of visitors uh, in, uh, in, in the north uh, reached 1.8 uh, million, uh, of which, on average, 77% are Turkish nationals. Obviously, the um, uh, tourism of the uh, Turkish Cypriots is mostly dominated by the uh, by Turkish uh, nationals, <coughs> but it has grown quite substantially. <coughs> uh, tourism generates uh, income and employment and helps raise the standard of living through the foreign exchange earnings it generates. This increased 
from under 200 million in 2003 to over 900 uh, million in 2017. Uh, the, the 900 million earnings, which is uh, in dollars, not euros, it's dollars, the, the figures, they represent 21% of the gross national income of uh, uh, Turkish uh, uh, Cypriots. Let me remind you that this was approximately the figure we had in Cyprus in the 90s, 1990s. Tourism was about 20 to 23 percent of uh, uh, national income. Therefore, now the Turkish Cypriots have the similar situation that we had in the 90s. Now, uh, if you look at uh, uh, tourism for Cyprus, it is less than, uh, than about 12 percent earnings uh, from uh, tourism are only 12 percent for um, uh, Greek, Greek Cyprus. <coughs> now, what has happened at the same time is that uh, there has been a, a big increase in hotel bed capacity. Uh, they have 12,000 uh, hotel beds in 2003. Now they have about 22,000. Most of these investments, however, like the tourists, like uh, the tourists, are uh, uh, Turkish capital, unfortunately, and therefore what it becomes obvious is that uh, Turkish Cypriot tourism is dominated by Turkey, both from the, from the point of view of uh, the, the visitors, but also from the capital and the uh, uh, creation of new hotel capacity. What is interesting as far as the Turkish Cypriots is concerned is of course the casinos. There are now 30 casinos in uh, the Turkish Cypriot uh, in the north, and they account, they, they have created 7,000. So what happened? We are trying to copy them. So we created a casino as well because of what's been happening in, uh, in the north. Okay. Uh, now the second sector is universities. It's a very interesting sector as far as uh, the Turkish Cypriots are concerned. And we are also copying what's, what, are, what is happening in, in, in the north. Um, there are five things, five issues that I want to raise regarding universities. The first one is that in 2003 there were six universities. In 2017, they, are, they were 17. And my information talks about some more being created uh, gradually. Okay, so uh, 17 universities uh, in the north. The second is that they are spread all over the north. Okay, there are in the three main towns in Kairinia, in Nicosia, and uh, Famagusta. But there are also in Lefka, in Morfu, uh, in Kapasha. Therefore, they are spread all over uh, the north. <coughs> the third issue uh, is that there are four big universities, four with more than 18,000 uh, students. The largest one is outside uh, Nicosia, and it's the Near East University with 28,000 people. And the other three are 18,000 uh, with 18,000 students, and it's the Eastern Mediterranean in Famagusta, the oldest university of the north, the American University in Kairinia, and the International University in, in Nicosia. This diagram shows two things. It shows the number of uh, students and the number of uh, universities so uh, okay what happened somebody got the <laughs> sorry <laughs> so I talked about three issues on the university let me talk about another two 
And th the fourth point about uh, uh, the universities in the north is the increasing number of students. It's, it's, it's something beyond <laughs> sort of the imagination that the Turkish Cypriots now have 101,000 uh, univer uh, university students. Okay, so, uh, and it was only uh, 30,000, this is, it was only 30,000 in two now 2003, now it's 101, and I don't know uh, if it continues uh, rising. But you can understand how important university education has become for the Turkish Cypriots, and it is a, uh, a foreign exchange uh, earning. Uh, earning earner. Uh, so what uh, is the fifth point is that uh, the, the, the uh, university education in the Turkish Cypriot economy now earns almost as much as tourism. Um, okay, no, let me let me talk about the, the change in the numbers. Uh, this is the change in the three ethnic groups uh, of the students. Uh, the, the, the one at the top is number of Turks, Turkish nationals, which grew from 18,000 to 56,000 between 2003 and 2017. Uh, the second is uh, the rising number is third country nationals, which were 2,000 in 2003, and now is 31,000. Therefore, there was a big jump in the number of third country nationals, mostly from the Middle East, I think, but also from Africa. Uh, from the Middle East, because most of the Middle East, uh, uh, Lebanon, uh, Syria, uh, Iraq, their universities are closed. Therefore, they have been able to attract uh, foreign students uh, in, uh, in the north. Uh, the number of Turkish, uh, of Turkish Cypriots has, is, is flat, is the, is the flat uh, line. Uh, they are about, uh, l they are less than 15,000. Uh, okay, so number of, so as a foreign exchange earner, you can see, I compare the foreign exchange earnings of tourism with the foreign exchange earnings of uh, the universities. And you can see that it is almost equivalent. It's, uh, it's about it's 100 million difference. But <laughs> the, the way that they are presented there, the, the, the big difference doesn't show. So now the Turkish Cypriots have the universities as one of the major um, income generating activities. Now. This was what happened with the Turkish Cypriot economy. Um, I want to um, tell you a few things about uh, the other uh, big change that has taken place in the Turkish Cypriot economy vis-a-vis -vis the Greek Cypriot in the sense uh, which is uh, the outcome of the opening of the crossing uh, of the uh, across the dividing lines. Again, I, there are four issues that I want to uh, describe because of that. And the first one is the visitors, which, uh, oh, I mean, they, uh, the number of visits between the two communities has shown uh, variation, but what is, in, what is um, uh, interesting is that there are more visits by the Turkish Cypriots than by the Greek Cypriots. Okay, so what we see here is uh, the Turkish Cypriots having more visits to the south than the Greek Cypriots to the north. But there is a big change in 2019. Okay. Why? Very clear. There was the devaluation of the Turkish Lira and the incentive to the Greek Cypriots to go on the north to buy petrol, medicines, and cheaper consumer goods was quite strong. So what happened in 2019?
the Greek Cypriots pay 2.4 million visits to the north, as opposed to the, Gre uh, to the uh, Turkish Cypriots, which were about two, 2 million. But uh, uh, you can see uh, the incentive, how the economic incentives have an impact on <laughs> this behavior. Uh, the second uh, interesting development uh, during this period is the fact that uh, there was a big increase in the movement of foreign nationals. Uh, okay, this was an unintended consequence, but because of the opening of the crossings, uh, there was originally, it was probably the foreign workers in Cyprus, but eventually it was the foreign tourists in the south that started going to the north. And what happened was a big, a big increase. Uh, we have data only since 2014, uh, and the data show that uh, from 1,100, uh, 1,100,000 visits of foreign nationals to the north jumped to 2.2 to 2 million hundred. There was a third. Uh, aspect of these uh, exchanges, and that was consumer spending. Okay, you would expect that consumer spending, given the relative affluence, it would be the Greek Cypriots that they would spend in, in, uh, in the north. It didn't happen like that. In actual fact, the Turkish Cypriots are spending much more in the south than the Greek Cypriots in the north which shows that they are more affluent than what we expected, okay? That they've improved and they were willing to come to the south uh, to shop in the more expensive shops, maybe because of quality and maybe because of wider choice, okay? That's possible explanations of why this uh, happened. But uh, he, he, over the years, the Turkish Cypriots spent 250 million euros uh, between 2003 and 2017, on, sorry, 2019, because for these uh, figures we have uh, data uh, up to 2019, uh, they spent 245 million uh, euros and the Greek Cypriots spent only 107. But again, there was a change. Uh, and uh, in 2019, the Greek Cypriots spent more money in the north than the Turkish Cypriots in the south. And you, you can see what's happening with the economic incentives of uh, lower prices. <coughs> and the fourth area of development in, uh, with the opening of the crossing lines is uh, um, uh, the Green Line Regulation. The European Union decided to introduce the Green Line Regulation uh, because of the uh, fact that the Greek Cypriots rejected uh, the annual plan and they considered it would be fair for the Turkish Cypriots to take advantage. And they did take advantage. Okay. Um, uh, they did uh, take advantage. Uh, the exchanges are uh, in favor of the Turkish Cypriots. Okay. Now these are the visits. Sorry, these are the visa cards. And you can see the top line is the expenditure by the Turkish Cypriots and the bottom line by the Greek Cypriots and how it changes in 2019 because of the devaluation of the Turkish uh, lira. Of course, the devaluation wasn't one year. It was a number of years. Uh, that made it much cheaper for them. And this one is the green line uh, regulation, the green line trading, which shows the top line is the Turkish Cypriot sales to Greek Cypriot uh, um, merchants, and the, uh, the bottom line is uh, uh, the, gr the Greek Cypriot sales to, to Turkish merchants. Uh, th there is an advantage of about 50 million uh, euros for Turkish Cypriots, which they had another bonus. If you remember in 2011, there was the Marie incident with the explosion of uh, 
the containers full of Syrian uh, ammunition and the destruction of the Basilicos uh, electricity. After that, the Greek Cypriots, they were obliged to try and find the solution uh, to, uh, to uh, the provision of electricity. So they asked, they asked the two chambers to have an agreement. They agreed, and the Greek Cypriots bought electricity uh, by about, uh, which cost about 30 million uh, euros. Therefore, uh, the, the advantage of the the Turkish Cypriots were about 80 million uh, from uh, Green Line trade. Um, okay. There are uh, one, two other points that I would like to make about the Turkish Cypriot economy. And uh, this, uh, the, the first point is the fact that um, uh, Turkish Cypriot economy depends very much on, uh, on Turkey in terms of, it, of international trade. As, uh, trade, as they, there was uh, an open international trade, uh, the Turkish Cypriots uh, try, uh, began importing quite heavily. Their domestic exports are very low. There are only, they used to be uh, about um, uh, they reached about 150 million in 2011, but since then they have declined and there are only 100 million dollars of uh, revenue from uh, domestic exports by the Turkish Cypriots. During that time, their imports from 470 million um, uh, dollars, they jumped to 1.1 uh, billion 800. Most of this is with Turkey. Therefore, the Turkish Cypriots are running very big deficits uh, in, of um, trade with uh, Turkey. Almost 60% of that deficit is with Turkey, and that means that annually they have a deficit of about a billion uh, with, uh, with Turkey. This is the trade. Uh, the, the low line is the export of the Turkish Cypriots. The big line is the uh, increase in the imports of um, uh, Turkey Cypriots, mostly, as I said, uh, from Turkey. There is a fifth uh, issue to talk, and this is the annual uh, needs of the Turkey Cypriots uh, for their um, fiscal deficits. Unfortunately, the Turkey Cypriots run very high uh, fiscal uh, magnitudes. Uh, the, their official data, okay, um, I'll, this is a little bit confusing, this uh, uh, diagram, but I will try and explain it. Um, okay, how do I explain it? The middle line, <laughs> the middle line is the official data as it's published by the Turkish Cypriots of their annual deficit. And this is, on average, about 7% over this period, 2003-2017. However, in the annual revenues, they include uh, Turkish aid. So if we take out Turkish aid, the real uh, deficit is the bottom line. Okay, so the bottom line shows about an annual deficit by the Turkish Cypriots in the fiscal magnitudes of about 13%. Okay, I'm uh, simplifying. I don't need to bother you with how it's changing because it doesn't matter. Now, the third line is also an interesting uh, aspect of what's happening with the Turkish Cypriots, and that they call it uh, credits from the Republic of Turkey. What is this? We, I mean, it's <laughs> obviously uh, Turkey is uh, lending the Turkish Cypriots. Not only are they providing them with assistance, but they're also providing with lending. And the interesting fact is that there is no mention of a, f of a public debt by the Turkish Cypriots. So they are lending it, and it's, it's an assistance, but they don't call it an assistance. 
They call it a, a credit from the Turkish uh, uh, Republic. <coughs> Um, okay, so this is a very big question mark. What happens uh, with, with this? Uh, and uh, it shows that uh, the dependence of the Turkish Cypriots or Turkey is much more widespread. <coughs> um, before I try to draw some conclusions from this analysis, let me uh, mention two other issues. The, uh, the most important other issue, of course, is the fact uh, that there is now a connection, a direct connection <laughs> between Turkey and uh, Northern Cyprus through the pipeline, which brings fresh water. That is a very big change that has happened in the Turkish Cypriot uh, community. It is an innovative approach by the Turkish engineers uh, to float a pipeline in the middle of the ocean. Bear in mind that uh, the uh, sea between uh, Turkey and Cyprus goes to about 3,000 depth. Therefore, it would be impossible uh, to just uh, put a pipeline at the bottom of the sea. They floated it, and it's a very innovative solution. What it means is that the Turkish Cypriots are now uh, more dependent on Turkey. And uh, they, uh, it's a very big change for the Turkish Cypriots because we know that up to the time that uh, this, uh, I don't remember exactly the day, the, the time, the year that uh, was uh, the connection, uh, the Turkish Cypriots were subjected to uh, cuts of their water supply. Uh, we know also all these things because it used to be on our side as well, but for Turkish Cypriots it was only up to about uh, three or four years ago. <coughs> and then there is a the population issue. Population issue is very important. It's changing the whole, uh, it, it is changing the north. Uh, the, according to the published data by the Turkish Cypriots, there are now 350,000, uh, the population of uh, the north is 350,000. Uh, the Turkish Cypriots used to be about 145,000. They may be 180, they may be 200, I don't know. It's very difficult to try and estimate. But obviously, with this uh, the, the developments in population, uh, it's possible that the Turkish Cypriots are now uh, just 50% of, of the total. How this will change, how this will impact the, uh, in the future, it's very difficult to say. Let me also say about another thing. Uh, in uh, 1974, there was, uh, in 1973, there was uh, uh, a small census by the Greek Cypriots, and they, measure, they, they uh, estimated uh, the population. They estimated the population of Kyrenia to be 3,000, 3,900. 1973. Today, the population of Kyrenia, and I'm talking about, uh, in, in actual fact, I'm talking about uh, a, a little bit, a few years back, it was over 50. Okay, completely changed. That's something that uh, have. Uh, that sort of creating an upside down uh, situation. The, the, the Kyrenias think that they can return to, the, uh, to Kyrenia, but where? <laughs> it's possibly, it's, it's impossible to think where it's going to happen. Okay, I draw, uh, I describe what I think have been the major changes in the, um, in the Turkish Cypriot uh, community. Um, let me offer a number of observations uh, on the issues. 
Obviously, the improvement in the standard of living of the Turkish Cypriots and of the infrastructure of the north, because there has been a very, uh, very big differences in the infrastructure, the roads, the water uh, situation, the electricity, uh, because in, in between 74 and 1990, the Turkish Cypriots depended on the supply of both water and of electricity from the south. Now this has changed completely. It's changed all. Um, okay, so uh, the situation is now very different of what it used uh, to be. So the improvement in the standard of living may be making it easier for a possible solution because, uh, uh, the, because there has been a, a, a relative convergence, not proper, but a relative convergence of the standard of living. Uh, the second, of course, is university education. That is a very good uh, uh, example. And uh, we have to, to admit that we are trying to copy. And uh, there has been, because of the success of the Turkish Cypriots, there has been a big effort to uh, en enhance the private universities of Cyprus. And there, ha there have been a big increase in the number of foreign students uh, in, uh, in, in the South as well. The third issue is tourism. OK, tourism is uh, we're both considered to be tourist areas. It's not so important in the South anymore. And there are other sectors that have been uh, developing much strongly. And, but uh, it is uh, the fact that, most, that uh, there is a development of tourism, and it's mostly uh, absorbing Turks, that is a good situation. And tourism can be, uh, say, complementary rather than um, uh, sort of competitive. The fourth issue is um, uh, the increased economic ties. As I have shown you, there have been an increase in economic ties between the two communities, not big enough to make a big difference. It's only about 3 or 4% of the respective uh, uh, gross national incomes. But uh, it shows that there is an incentive, and it can be an, an important issue uh, for the future. <coughs> the fifth uh, point, of course, is the pipeline. The pipeline offers uh, something very concrete. And if uh, uh, there is a solution, and if uh, uh, Turkey continues to provide uh, water to the north, I mean, it can help both sides, and it can be used for uh, agriculture, um, uh, for agricultural development, not only uh, for uh, uh, industrial uses. Obviously, the population creates a lot of issues, and it's not an easy uh, uh, subject. Uh, I don't know what I can say about uh, uh, But the changing demographics, changing the, uh, the possible uh, solution, and as go they are going to make much more difficult uh, a solution to the Cyprus problem because a lot of these people would probably want to stay because uh, a lot of them uh, now uh, would have been um, uh, born uh, in Cyprus. Uh, obviously, the most negative aspect of the Turkish of the development in the Turkish Cypriot community is the dependence on Turkey. It's a dependence on Turkey on uh, uh, on trade, on um, uh, tourism, on university. Um, I forgot to, uh, to emphasize that because uh, 56,000 of the university students out of the 101,000 are Turks. So again, even in the university, the dominant factor is Turkey, and they have a lot of uh, capital invested both in the universities and in tourism. So uh, the involvement of Turkey uh, with the Turkish Cypriot economy, it's going to be an added uh, difficulty. Uh, 
And there are people who believe that Turkey now dominates uh, the political situation as well. Even though I accept what Michalis has been saying and uh, King Ji has shown uh, tremendous uh, independence and courage to advocate uh, a solution. So these are uh, sort of what's been happening. So trying to answer the question, um, what are the chances of a solution? Have the economic developments uh, created an environment that we can hope that they will, uh, they will uh, help in the solution of uh, the Cyprus problem? Well, uh, my estimate is now the Turkish Cypriots don't have an incentive to unite with the Greek Cypriots. Apart from the fact that if they want to uh, sort of get rid of Turkey, and, uh, then that's their major, not the economic anymore, not what we believed uh, in, in the past, that we would be offering them the chance uh, to live on a better standard uh, of living. Um, obviously, we are not seeking compromises. We are uncompromising on various issues. Two uh, issues um, are important if you think of the willingness to compromise. One is uh, uh, the um, uh, energy situation, and we are not willing to compromise. And we did not offer to the Turkish Cypriots to participate. It would have been very easy to create a structure where Turkish Cypriots could participate in the exploitation of uh, natural gas and if uh, there is uh, oil. Uh, the second one, of course, the big failure between the two communities has been the halloumi. The fact that we have not been able and we politicize the issue of halloumi and uh, is an, in, an uh, indication of our unwillingness to compromise on both sides. <laughs> our Greek side, I agree with Michalis, is much more uh, recalcitrant than the Turkish Cypriots, but it's both sides. They, uh, it, uh, the issues have been politicized uh, on, on both sides. So fortunately, my conclusion would be similar with um, uh, uh, that uh, the future does not bode well. I doubt if we would be able on these issues alone uh, to find uh, a solution. It's only if uh, <laughs> other things change. Thank you very much. First I want to apologize for the breaks with the projector. It seems that it's overheating because we had a lot of heat today as well. Thank you very, very much, Simeon. Yeah, I don't know whose work was more interesting. I think both were very interesting <laughs> and we enjoyed both of these uh, lectures very, very much and we're much wiser. Are there any questions to either speaker? Or do you want to do them in private? <laughs> Chat with them afterwards. Let me, oh yes, please. Can I ask any idea what the current situation is? <laughs> <laughs> My question was about whether you had any idea as to what was happening currently uh, because of the situation with COVID and the economy on the other side. Okay, it's it's um, uh, I I would it would be I don't want to try and. Um, uh, estimate what the situation would be, how it will affect. Uh, it is true, however, 
that given that the Turkish Cypriots depend on sectors with foreign exchange earning uh, for them to be viable, it means that it's going to be very difficult for the Turkish Cypriots uh, because tourism will probably not revive uh, this year. I didn't touch it, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and, and of course, uh, even the universities will probably suffer quite a lot uh, because they depend uh, on both uh, students from Turkey and students from other uh, countries. Now, what does this mean? Uh, Will, will it create a better uh, environment through which we can hope that there will, uh, the two sides will come together? I don't know. I don't want to speculate. It's too difficult uh, to try and, uh, and guess what the effects will be uh, of these changes, of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Mior Mihalis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because two years ago you were giving us uh, different, <laughs> different scenarios, now both of you are giving us a very pessimistic one. Even though we know, you, you, you just uh, presented it to us uh, with graphs or uh, yeah, uh, uh, figures and with uh, analysis, political analysis. So what I want to say, I want to say so many things. Michael, siempre me la van. This is what shall we do? I don't want. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, okay, thank. <laughs> okay. Um, on the contrary, I, pre I, I assume that the fact that the Turkish Cypriots are in a much better uh, situation and they have a much higher standard of living, I think it, it, it and the fact that we can see that and we can anticipate that what we assumed would have been the cost for the Greek Cypriots to raise the standard of living of the Turkish Cypriots would have been, uh, is less, uh, that this would have facilitated. The economic relations uh, have created a bondage between the two communities, but very, very little. The fact, however, that, that consumers are willing to cross the lines in order to, con to uh, shop uh, on, on either side shows that it's, uh, it's potential. However, what I'm saying and why I am reluctant to believe that uh, uh, the Turkish Cypriots would be uh, willing for a solution is the fact that now they are dominated by Turkey. That's my main conclusion. That's my uh, problem, that I don't see how they can get away from the domination of Turkey. Sorry? It's stronger now. It's, it's, it, it's stronger because Turkey is investing heavily in the, in, in the Turkish Cypriot. I invested by Russians, by Israelis. Okay, yes. It should awake invest, but it hasn't awakened. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Any other questions? <laughs> 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 
Well, again, thank you very much, Miko, Mihali. Thank you very much, Simeon, for a lovely uh, present, for lovely presentations. I would like also to thank the Canadian High Commission, in, uh, which is in Athens, but also a credit to Cyprus for sponsoring this evening, and let you know that both presentations will be on our Facebook tomorrow. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.